Good afternoon. We're delighted that you're all here. And we're going to, uh, this session is really going to run as uh, hopefully you will be the major participants because we've gotten together a group of uh, three, possibly four people uh, who've had uh, different experiences and at least two of whom are in major positions that profoundly uh, influence uh, training, education, and have a keen insight as to what the opportunities are today. So if you bear with me, I would like to begin by just going a little bit back in time. Back in time. What do these men have in common? Anybody? Come on, what do they have in common? You know them all. So these are three of probably the most famous biochemists who ever lived. And in the early part of the 20th century, they put biochemistry on the map. And you know the pathways, the Krebs cycle, and all of that stuff, which I presume you have to memorize the same way that we had to memorize them. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Now, wh why would I put this up? Because I think it's a very important point. <clears throat> These men, uh, unfortunately, there were no women at this stage in, that, in the, the explosive, explosive growth of biochemistry. These men were all MDs. Because at the time of their work in Europe, you could not get a PhD in a medical school. It didn't exist nor did it exist in the United States. So they went as physicians into leading basic science departments in outstanding universities in Europe, particularly in Germany and, and elsewhere, and made these major discoveries which formed the basis of the biochemical revolution that influenced that whole period of time. But they were physicians. And they ended their science knowing about disease. Now think about it. Very often we train PhD scientists who want to work on something that influences human health, but you don't know much about the basis of disease, at least in something more than what the general public may know. Now maybe that's an exaggeration, but part of the purpose of this course has been to help bridge this gap. So a quick note about the gap. Believe it, and I point this out because things are cyclic in almost everything in our lives, uh, including politics, funding, and science. So at the moment, we're in one phase of a cycle, but I don't think one should feel that this is a permanent state of affairs. At any rate, to give you an idea of what it was like, uh, when the NIH was created after the Second World War, American medical schools and even hospitals were transformed almost overnight into major research centers. And where did the scientists come from to conduct that? Most of them in those early days came from the National Institutes of Health. Now, many of them were PhD, in fact, I would think a large proportion of them were, and they were responsible for some of the incredible advances that took place in that era. Now, in the 50s and 70s, if you were a bright young person and you finished your, your college or so, or medical school, and you wanted to do research, all you had to do was have some good ideas. You got a reasonably good record, believe it or not, funding was not the limiting factor. And that's what accounted for huge numbers of people coming largely here and other places to be trained. Also after the war, the GI Bill for the first time provided financial support for anybody who was in service to acquire any legitimate education, college, graduate school, medical school, and so a whole middle class and others who never would have had an opportunity, perhaps, 
to go to even then the expensive uh, colleges and universities flooded in at a time when science was growing. And then in the 80s, Jim Weingarten, who was director here, pointed out that the physician scientists were beginning to decrease for many reasons. Uh, medicine had changed, the demands of hospital had changed. There's a lot written about this, which I won't go into. But the point was it created a huge gap between the basic scientists who now chaired the basic science departments in medical schools giving PhDs and the needs and interests of human health patients. And that's the beginning of the gap. And one of the outcome of that period of time was that there were career opportunities, many, many, for PhDs to work with physician scientists, not for them. So there are two quotes that summarize really the whole thing of what I want to say. This is from a uh, German scientist who wrote, much is known, but unfortunately in different heads, which is our situation today. Many of us speak a very different scientific language and have trouble understanding what the other people, be they engineers, mathematicians, systems analysis, molecular biologists, etc. And the other is a quote from Tom Cech, uh, who was formerly the uh, president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, Tom was a big supporter of this uh, demystifying medicine effort. And he wrote, it's self-evident that any scientist working on a problem which may have clinical relevance should know something about the disease and about how it affects people. So one of the ways of trying to render this communication problem uh, were to set up pathobiology programs uh, where PhD scientists in some places, they saw patients and a lot of pathology, and it was different in different institutions. And there were various groups and foundations that supported this, culminating with the Howard Hughes program, which gave $28 million to 23 programs over six years. Unfortunately, some of us think this support terminated at the time when Janelia Farms was opened. And in 2002, the demystifying business was started here at NIH, and it was based on the fact that we had a large, extraordinary clinical facility here, uh, the clinical center, with an extraordinary staff of clinical investigators, physician scientists, advanced technology, and so forth, coupled with uh, all of the more basic science going on in each of the different institutes. So putting together the program that most of you, I hope, have either been here or watched on the video or so forth, where what we've tried to do is to bring together some people knowledgeable about the clinical problems and what they are doing here to do research on them and people at the forefront of where an understanding of the more basic processes are concerned. And it's really been quite successful. We're in the 17th year. Uh, there are people in 18 uh, different countries and 18 North American institutions who regularly use the material that's presented here as part of their graduate training and some of them even undergraduate training. So the summary is that the data that's been accumulated, which I won't go into, says that teaching pathophysiology, another word for disease, to PhDs is timely. The surveys indicate people want to know something about the disease that they are working with and even major health challenges unrelated to their research. It certainly is challenging. There is outcome data that indicates that positions become available for people who have this background. And for some, it's preparatory for academic positions in a clinical department, not working for a physician scientist, but working with and tenure track positions. Now that built up 
substantially until about roughly 15 or more years ago when things got very tight in the hospital and medical school world. So that opportunity has diminished, but there is some data to indicate that uh, there still is substantial, uh, whoops, what have I done? Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I did get some data from the AAMC, which indicated that if I remember correctly, something like uh, close to 40% of PhD graduates 25 years ago had positions that were in a clinical department, primary, secondary, et cetera. And as of a year ago, the AAMC data indicates it's down to around 14 or 15 percent. So, okay, so this is a bit of the background uh, that led us to where we are at a time when science has probably never been more challenging, never been more exciting. And I would point out that every one of the scientific revolutions that's happened seems to be happening at a shorter time limit. The time limit from basic physiology and to biochemistry. And then it was shorter to molecular biology and even shorter to genetics and even shorter now into the exploding world of informatics. So this is a dynamic thing and there are a lot of unanswered questions. Nobody knows exactly how to confront the problems. But we do know that for young people, who want to do science and be part of this uh, explosive business, there's probably never been a better time, despite many of the practical problems that one recognizes exist. Okay, so to uh, discuss more details of this and particularly to enlist uh, your responses, we're very fortunate that we have three speakers, well, speakers or Consultants, okay. Uh, so the first is uh, Jonathan Udall, uh, who is uh, uh, the head of the cell biology section of NIAID. So John's an MD, PhD in immunology from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he did elegant work and still does on the use of monoclonal antibodies to understand influenza infection and so forth. But we have posted on the website a book that Jonathan has written that he's going to comment about, I'm sure, of the, the most, I find, most exciting, thoughtful approach at any age of why one might want to do science and what might you do to make it more likely to be successful. Uh, and then uh, our second participant is Sharon Milgram, whom I'm sure is known to all of you uh, since 2007, just 10 years ago. Sharon has been the director of the intramural uh, uh, training and education uh, uh, division uh, in the intramural program. Uh, her, she was until recently, a very active scientist studying signal transduction, particularly in cystic fibrosis, and came here from the University of North Carolina to head up the OIT program, which has been very successful, as I'm sure you all have participated in. And then uh, our number four hitter is Michael Gondisman, who should be known to all of you, who's the Deputy Director for Intramural Research. Uh, I wanna read to you something which some of you may not be aware of, what the Deputy Director is responsible for. Coordination of activities and facilitating cooperation among the 24 Institute and center-based scientific directors to achieve the scientific training and public health mission of the NIH intramural program. He provides guidance for the entire program. He oversees and approves the hiring of all NIH principal investigators and is the institutional officer responsible for human subject research protection 
research integrity, technology transfer, animal care and use at the NIH. Michael has been here at the NIH as the director, I believe, for 24 years now. And those 24 years have been characterized by the beginning of extraordinary programs that have influenced uh, all of you, uh, such as the post-baccalaureate training program, the graduate partnership program, and a great variety of other activities. He is an outstanding cell biologist uh, and is uh, uh, the chief of the NCI Laboratory of Biology, one of the leading figures in the studies of drug resistance. Uh, Michael has been widely recognized for all of his activity with many awards, the most recent of which I think we all want to join in congratulating him because today, on May Day 2018, he just learned he was elected to the National Academy of Science. So. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm not sure this is what Wynn wanted, but it's too late to change. So <laughs> you're going to get some pragmatic advice on how to make the next step. And I, I am an MD-PhD, but uh, I, I hated medicine, actually. I'm the opposite of a role model for young MDs. And, and I've basically functioned as a PhD for my entire career. So this advice is for you PhDs making the next step. Pragmatically, how do you get a job from being a postdoc? Uh, so here's the book, said book. Uh, I spent about a year writing this book. I took a sabbatical. It's an absolute labor of love. I've had a very selfish existence at NIH. I mean, I love the intramural program, and we have the opportunity to focus on research, and I've really done very little else. But this is one of the things I've done to, to give back, and it, it's very opinionated. I hope you find it funny. Um, some of it will be useful. Some of it won't be useful. You know, I, I hope you read it and, and take uh, what's good. As Mike just pointed out, the best part of the book are actually the cartoons uh, by a guy named Alex Dent, who was a postdoc here. And, the cartoons are taken from his career at NIH when he was the weekly cartoonist for the, um, for the, um, for the NIH um, newsletter. Uh, the cover, actually, I'm inordinately proud of. Uh, these are figures from my career. I just went through all my papers as PDFs and, and pulled out not necessarily the most important data, but, but the figures that emotionally meant, meant the most to me. And at the end of your career, this is pretty much is what it'll look like, right? You remember these, these great experiments you did, and particularly the people you did them with, particularly the people, postdocs in the lab and students and collaborators. I mean, in the end, science is um, the best part of science uh, at the end of the day are the people you meet. Okay, so you all know this now. Uh, it's no longer a, one of the dirty little secrets of biomedical research. Um, most people, at least in days gone by, went into graduate school to get a PhD with the dream, the hope, the expectation even of becoming a principal investigator. And uh, it was never completely true. I think when I was a student in the uh, late 70s, if you went to a decent graduate school and you weren't completely psychotic, the odds are you got a chance to run your own lab. I don't know what the numbers were. It was probably something like 50%, something like that. And, and today the number is less. And this now is, is it, you know, we call it alternative careers. Being a PI, numerically, is the alternative career. So most of you, um, you being the collective PhDs in the country, will be doing something else with your PhD other than running a, a research lab. So I did some research on the web. I will try to update my figures. This, this is a really nice flow diagram that I found. And as far as I can tell, reading the, the information on the website, it's from 2012. Maybe, maybe Sharon's got something more up to date. Uh, but th this is interesting. Uh, on average, wh what happens to you? So 86,000 uh, graduates start PhD programs, 37% drop out. That, that I found shocking, actually, that there's such a high dropout rate. Many of those get masters. Uh, the numbers obviously are a bit fuzzy. Uh, we don't even know how many postdocs are in the country. I, I guess maybe there's a better number now, between 40 and 70,000. Um, uh, here's an important number, right? Something like less than 8% of entering PhD students will become tenure-track faculty, yet as of 2012, 53% rank research professorship as their most desired career. So those numbers are probably still pretty close. And what's important here is the, uh, 
is what the real unemployment rate is. The number I've always spouted is two or three percent, because I thought that's what it was. And then this was six years ago. It's probably worse now. And if we count unemployed as doing things other than what you train for, such as being an Uber driver, right? I think we'd have to count that as not employed as a biomedical research. Uh, it's about a 10% unemployment rate, okay? And this is something that needs to be fixed. I started getting involved in postdoc issues 20 years ago because I was appalled at the low salaries that postdocs were being paid. I still am, it's better now, but I think we can do a lot better. Uh, and I'm still appalled at, at the lack of modeling. There have been a number of August reports from very good people. Uh, there was a paper in PNAS, I don't know, four or five years ago now with Harold Varmus on it and Shirley Tillman. And I read this paper, I was actually starting the book and tears came to my eyes. I said, oh my God, finally powerful influential people get this message, we have to fix this career, we can model how many people come in, how many jobs there are, we really need to start doing this. And in those five years, as far as I can tell, nothing has been done. There was enormous blowback, particularly from universities. Universities, filled with liberal professors who act like the most vicious capitalists you've, you've ever seen in your life, right? So this is a problem, and most of us, uh, faculty members, PIs, are entirely sympathetic to this problem, and it needs to be addressed. It can't always be swept under the rug, okay? And, and we can talk about that uh, later on, how to start addressing this. Uh, this is something that has just not gone away. Okay, so I'm gonna plow ahead here. If you're gonna plow ahead, and I'm gonna give you advice if you are still intent on being a PI, and many of you are not, and great. Uh, but if you are, okay, and I just wanna make sure you know this, right? You have chosen an incredibly difficult career, right? It never really gets easier. The hardest you'll probably ever work under the most pressure is as an assistant professor if you get one of these prized positions and you're now faced with a whole bunch of things you don't know about and you aren't very good at because you weren't selected for. Like choosing people, supervising people, organizing a lab, dealing with all sorts of issues, teaching, okay, and on top of all that, getting money, getting money, getting money, getting money. Okay, so after that, it gets a little easier, but talk to people out there. Right, uh, they're under a lot of pressure. And even as a full professor, even if you're in the National Academy, I met an Academy member last week when I was visiting Hopkins, fantastic life, fantastic career, great publications, and she can't get funded. So you're as good as your last paper. That's the way it is in science. And some of that is good and some of that not so good. So don't kid yourself, you're in for a long haul. And we're not talking about poverty wages, particularly if you make it to the summit, but you can make a lot more money for a lot less work doing many, many other things, right? And life in the end is about happiness. It's not about some arbitrary standard. It isn't really climbing a cliff. You should be happy. That, that to me, should be your main goal. That's the main goal for my four children. They should find something they like to do that they're happy doing, that pays reasonably well. So some very practical advice, not in the slides, marry someone wealthy, right? <laughs> All things being equal. Uh, okay, so, if you're gonna stay in academic type science, and there's a lot, it could still be a company, and you can be doing basic research or translational research, but really, you know, academic kind, where you're competing and you're struggling for, for funding or money from the company. What you need to make this worthwhile, you have to love science. Just love science. Basically, you, you can't do without it. And it isn't just the discoveries. For most of my career, I thought what I really loved about science was either making the discoveries or being involved in them. And I do, and that is the, 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 the highest point, but that's not the major reward. The, the major reward is loving the process of making a discovery, reading a paper, getting an idea, designing an experiment, screwing it up the first time, right? Uh, everything's a disaster. Seeing a glint of the truth, perhaps, in your data, refining it, doing it again, doing it 100 times. Right, and enjoying every bit of that, all of the frustration, all the striving, all the communicating and collaborating. That is the part you really should love. And I think it's sad that we've made science into something like music or dance, where you have to have this passion to make it worthwhile, but, but I think it's realistic, right? If that burning desire is within you, okay. You know, stay in science, satisfy it. So, we already had one, one, one slide of Einstein, here's another. 
talking to Freud, the state of mind which enables a man to do work of this kind, science, is akin to that of the religious worshiper or the lover. The daily effort comes from no deliberate intention or program, but straight from the heart. You've got to feel lucky that someone lets you work in a lab and actually pays you, right? My whole life, I felt that way. You know, you've got to feel at 10 o'clock when, when you look at your watch, you know, oh, shit, I'm going to be late. That it's worth, you know, not having any sort of decent family or love life. Okay, and what does it take? It takes obsession. It really does. If you're going to compete in basic science, if nothing else, you are competing with people who are obsessed with the same problem you are. And it really takes this obsession. And uh, not quite like, like Carrie, right? You, don't, you do not have to be a manic depressive, right? Borderline psychotic. But you really should be obsessed with a problem that, that you're studying. That, that is all part of it. And it isn't always, you know, peaches and cream being a scientist. A lot of time you're filled with angst because you have this thing that's bothering you that you can't figure out. And that angst, this obsession, is what drives great discovery and, and what makes it worthwhile, right? Trying to really scratch that itch of not knowing things. Right. Okay, so this is basically your life uh, a, a, as a scientist, right? If you're, if you're checking off, you're not married yet, where you are. It, you're not necessarily going to have a normal family life. You can, but many people don't. And just some advice as a, uh, someone who, who muddled through it, uh, fatherhood and marriage, you don't have to be perfect, right? But it's useful to find people around you who will cut you a lot of slack. That, that's for sure. That's for sure. Okay, so, right, uh, you're going to be a PI. Uh, there's not going to be some point in your career where a fairy finds you and flies over you and sprinkles you with dust, and now you're a PI, right? From, from the get-go, and I think even as a starting graduate student, you've got to have the idea that what you're studying, you are responsible for. You own this project. It's not on your PI to know it. It's on you to know it. So that, I think that's true even as a graduate student, but it is particularly true. Uh, as a PhD, and people are going to hire you for the next job because you are the world's expert in what you are doing. That, that's one of the great things about biology. We don't need a trillion dollar machine in Geneva to study the nature that we're going to study. We can study it at the level of the bench with our own two hands, with pipetters and relatively uh, inexpensive equipment, okay? And we each study something so narrow Right? Because biology is so big. It's not like physics where everyone has to study a few particles. We have all of biology, all of medicine to study, filled with enigmas, that you should be the expert, the world's expert on what you're doing. That is the expectation of a department that's going to hire you, that you are the world's expert. Right? You've got to just not just know what you're doing. You've got to know the literature. If there's an old literature, you should know that as well. This comes across incredibly well when you're interviewing someone for a job, and they cite a paper from the 1940s. Whoa, this is a serious individual. They, they have really thought about their field. They know everything they need to know, right? You should try to know personally the major scientists in the field. This is what meetings are for. They are not to sit through a bunch of boring talks, right? You go to a meeting to meet people. Uh, if we had another reading for just watching the talks, we can do it on Skype, right? So at the meeting, get out of your comfort zone. Force yourself to, to meet the leading figures in your field. They say, come on, I want to show you something in my poster. Meet people. Just put yourself out there. Most people are flattered by the attention. Okay? And many of us are introverted. I was when I started as well. I know people find that hard to believe who know me now. You, you have to force yourself out of your comfort zone and, and, and get yourself out there. Okay? And during the talks, if you're going to go and not just ski all day, keystone meeting, right? Put your hand up there. Ask a question. Ask five questions. There'll be a buzz. Well, who is she? Boy, she is really asking insightful questions. Uh, is she looking for a job? This is how you get jobs. Make yourself known. And just, just a practical advice. If you're going to give a talk at a meeting, it's an amazing thing. You get your voice in front of the meeting as a question, make a statement during someone's talk, you're going to be much less nervous when you give your own talk. Just some innate human psychology there. Speak in front of a group you're much less nervous the second time. First time, your heart's going to be beating. That's true of everybody. Okay? It is best to be really ambitious. Have big ambitions. Okay? The ideal is to change the course of your field or start a new field. 
always challenge yourself. New, 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 right? One of the reasons I love science and wasn't so fond of medicine, medicine, you do what they tell you, basically, or you go to jail, right? And get sued for malpractice. Science, the expectation is you get to think of something new. So take advantage of that. Think, think, think. Science is mostly about creativity at the top level. You all have the potential to be creative. Use it. New things. And, and just if you have some great new ideas, expect criticism. The better the idea, the more likely it is to be true, the more intense the criticism. You, get, you have to fight through that. And self-confidence is a big part of becoming a successful scientist. OK, what do we do in NIH? Right? We make discoveries. They're not really discoveries, though, until we publish papers. You have to publish papers. This is really, really important. Every step of your career, you're going to have to publish papers. And I've seen it with my own postdocs. The more papers they have, the more job, job opportunities they have. Never pass up an opportunity to write a review, okay? particularly a short review. Practice writing. Get your name out there. Establish yourself as an expert. More publications. And I'm not encouraging you to, to, to make crap papers, shoddy publications. No. But there's often smaller projects that you can publish as separate papers. In addition to the big thing, the big thing, that's the new thing that's going to get you your job. Publish, publish, publish. You, you see, publish or perish as a bad thing. Uh, uh, it's not a bad thing. We are paid to make discoveries, and we publish them, OK? So publishing papers is really, really important. OK, uh, collaboration is essential. There's so many new techniques today. They're expensive. They're arduous. Uh, they're incredibly involved. You're not going to be an expert in everything. So um, uh, collaboration is essential. Uh, you will increase your productivity. You will increase your profile because more people will know you. Labs you collaborate with, if the PI is influential, they can write you letters. They can help you later on in your career. Uh, a good collaboration that will deepen your knowledge enormously into the subject you're collaborating in. And just because you have to read about it, you're talking with your colleagues about it. Uh, your interpersonal skills will improve because you've got to deal with a collaborator. And uh, most collaborations, there's some friction that you usually have to overcome. And you will learn a lot about human nature in dealing with your collaborators and smoothing things out. Just good, good, good. And then best of all, it's really fun. Science is most fun when it's done collectively. Uh, it's great to have a discovery yourself. It's better to have it with more people, right? The, the collective joy is amazing. And I put this cartoon in with a purpose here. You can't collaborate to the point where you're getting nothing done on your own major project, right? You're going to have to have that big paper still that's going to get that door open to get a job, OK? So you collaborate. Uh, easy collaborations are best. More serious collaborations are more your effort. You have to think more carefully about them. OK, but in general, collaboration is a good thing. OK, you know, you think you want to be a PI, but listen, it doesn't always work out, right? And it is OK to switch your career goals midstream. It happens a lot, actually, right? So if it's something that really captures you, and say you're working in science, and maybe even you're really good at it, and maybe you could get a job, but you just think, man, I don't want to do this. OK, fine. You really don't want to do it. You shouldn't be miserable for the rest of your life. Don't do it. And even if you're successful doing it and you're not happy, you're going to make all those people who are in your lab and around you and your family, they're going to be miserable. So don't do that. Do the other thing that, that you're intrigued with. OK? Uh, listen, if, if you get an interview for a tenure track job, prepare. Prepare yourself, right? And just in general, any interview you get for any job there's always an exception, but my advice is never turn down an interview, right? Uh, one, you never know. You know, you go to a job, you think, oh, man, I don't think I want to go there. And then end of that day, thank God, this place is incredible. I had no idea. Okay, so just always go for interviews. And when you go, no matter, even if you think the place is not the place you want and you think it's not good, whatever, don't ever leave the impression when you go for an interview that you don't think this is the best job in the entire world and you wouldn't be the happiest person alive to get that job, OK? You're, you're not lying to them. And if they offer you a job, then we can decide whether we want this job or not, OK? You want to leave a good impression. Um, just 
every time you go for a job interview, you will get better at the job interview as well. Every time. Okay, so never turn down interviews. Right? Most important part of your day, hone your seminar. is going to be your research seminar. Right? And be sure to have to show the, the, the audience, the faculty who are potentially going to be your colleagues, that you have the, the, the big picture, that you know why what you're doing is important. Right? Important. Not just necessarily the little importance or the immediate clinical impact, but the broader importance, the, the, the whole uh, fabric of biology. You're going to have to show your fundability. In a perfect world, you wouldn't. In this world, you have to. You have to show the faculty you're working on something that NIH will give you money to study. Uh, obviously, you, most of you know this, it's really, really good to get a K award. Uh, some places won't even look at you unless you have a K grant to have that bridge funding to, to start. Um, there are grant writing courses here that, that Sharon could tell you about. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities here to, to, uh, um, to learn about uh, getting uh, grants and, and, and show that you know about the system. There's a negative knock on people who come to NIH that as being NIH postdocs, you don't know how to get funding, right? You haven't written grants. Uh, I think A is not necessarily true and B is good. Uh, I want you as a postdoc to do science, right? And then when you need to get funding, you'll learn how to do it. That's fine. Okay, uh, you're going to meet a whole bunch of department members. Uh, usually it's at least a day, if not two. You know, bone up on who you're going to meet. Read their recent papers. Uh, show them you're going to be the best colleague they ever could have. Right? Do your homework. Sometimes you'll get just one or two interviews. They're looking to hire someone they want to work with. A little flattery can get you a long way in life. Okay? Don't be false to yourself, but come across as the best person you can be. Okay, what am I going to do? Choosing a career path at least once a year. And this is something that NIH now mandates, that PIs have to sit down with their postdocs once a year, which I think is a fantastic thing. At least once a year, if not more, discuss your strengths and weaknesses uh, um, as a scientist with your advisor and your career potential, at least once a year. What, in their opinion, are you doing well, aren't doing so well? What do they think you could be? What do you think you could be? And have a serious discussion with them, okay? And don't worry that they're going to be disappointed that you don't want to be a PI. Uh, that used to be the case, I think, much more often than it is now. And whatever, it's not their life, it's your life, okay? Very often, the, the days gone by before we really had this kind of um, attention to careers, what would often happen is, the PI would be thinking, man, this person isn't really suited for PI, and the postdoc would be thinking, man, I'm not really suited to be a PI, but I don't want to disappoint the PI, right? And so they, they never got together. And then when they would, it was this great sense of relief. Oh, God, yeah, we're on the same page here. Okay, so once a year, sit down with your PI. Um, try to develop secondary mentors, other faculty in your department or other people in your field who you can also get advice from. None of us is perfect giving advice that should be obvious to you. And, and sometimes your PI is a terrible person for getting advice from sometimes, right? There's other people around who will help you, others, right? Uh, I am one, right? If you ever want some general career advice, just email me and, and, and we can get together. I'll buy you coffee and we can talk about it. There's plenty of other people here who have the same attitude, okay? For non-academic jobs, what I've seen from my own people getting these jobs, networking is absolutely critical. So for people taking pictures, just email me and I'll send you the slides, okay? And everyone can have the slides, no, no problem. I mean, I don't, you can keep taking pictures, but I'll just send you the presentation, okay? So there are the, one of the great things about being a postdoc at NIH, there are lots of jobs that you guys have the inside track to, right? So there's NIH extramural. Ma many people from my lab, particularly our, our department, laboratory of viral diseases, we have many people in NIH extramural. We have many people at the FDA. Who's ever heard of BARDA? Anyone in this room? Right, they have a billion dollars each year to spend, right? They've hired several former uh, postdocs from the Laboratory of Viral Diseases, my, my home lab. There are places like that around Washington you have never heard of that hire people that are really fun, cool jobs to have, okay? So here, networking is really, really critical. This is one of the best places in the country to get a job with a biomedical PhD. For policy jobs, it is by far the best place in the country to get jobs, right? There's a whole bunch of policy jobs as well. You want to fix the system, D.C. is where it's got to be fixed. And there are jobs both in and out of the federal government where you can work on scientific policy. 
Uh, for company jobs, it can be really, really hard contacting people at companies. Even when you read their papers, they don't have their email addresses on it. They tend to be very protective of email addresses. So even getting your foot in the door can be hard. Meetings are a great place to introduce yourself to people in company jobs and start networking at, at that level. Okay, so I'm going to end with some gratuitous life advice uh, from my 64 years on this planet. Uh, so, uh, life is not fair. Uh, nobody is the big, biggest fish here, right? Everybody is somewhere down on this, uh, on this uh, uh, fish eat fish uh, slide. Uh, so just don't expect life to be fair be, be, because it isn't, right? And you have to struggle at, at some level. And you may think the other guy has it much easier. But don't ever think that. You never know what troubles somebody else has, okay? So, you know, just everyone's got this deal. Life isn't fair. You take the lumps as they come. And in general, you want to be the optimist. I know it's hard. Uh, this is interesting because I noticed that this is like NIH specific. Uh, <laughs> whatever. Be the optimist, okay? Again, life isn't fair. No one's life is perfect. Try to be as happy as you can. We're all born with a different set point for our affect. Try to be the happy person. Happy people are happier by definition. I know that's a tautology, but it's still true. And other people like them more, and you'll collaborate better, and your science will be better. A crucial part of science is, is fun, enjoying it, loving it, sharing that fun. Okay? It's a critical part of it. Okay. Uh, life is truly a marathon. Right? It, it's a long slog through life. It's a great thing, but you will have setbacks, right? Enjoy the journey. Family and friends, that's a key, a key to a happy life, right? And, and family, yeah. Uh, I think as a young scientist, you'll have time for two things. One is science, and the other is one other thing. One other thing. It could be a serious hobby. It could be family. It could be something else. But one other thing, for most of us, it, it's family. Love your family. And, and again, you do not have to be a perfect parent. Right? You know, I think your generation tries too hard at parenting. My generation was much more free range. We never saw our parents. We, we turned out okay. Right? And my kids were free range. They, they all turned out fine. Right? We, we weren't, we, my wife's a pediatrician. We didn't have a huge amount of time to shepherd them everywhere. And everything is okay. And humor, you know, some people think humor should not be in the laboratory. This is ridiculous. I mean, we're, we're human beings. One of the best parts of life is sharing a joke with each other. Okay? So humor should be an integral part of everyday life. This is one of the ways we get through life. And just uh, last thing, not trivial, every day try to get some exercise. You will live longer. It will improve your affect, and it may even save your life at the end of the day. So sooner or later, some serious health concern, something serious will happen to you. In my case, uh, all of a sudden, I went from being perfectly healthy to needing a quadruple cardiac bypass. That happened in one day clinically, right? And something like that happens to you, you're going to be much better able to deal with it if you're super healthy going into it. You could get cancer, you could have some other problem. Uh, being healthy is really, really important. And there's just this magical thing, you know, I know what it's like to work in the lab. Nothing works most days. Very frustrating. Go to the gym, work out, you feel a little better about yourself, right? So every day, right? Five days at least each week, Try to get some exercise. My first rule of exercise, 10 minutes is better than nothing, right? Every day, something. Okay, so that's it. That's all, folks. And I'm here for you guys. Uh, email uh, the book. If I think Wynn said it's on the website, but if you can't get it, just email me on the return email. There'll be a link to it, and it's in a Google folder, and you just download it. I want to... Thank John for covering some really important things, but I'm actually going to disagree with a few of them. Sure. And at some point yeah. when I, I, I sort of have to run, so it's not a day for an in-depth uh, discussion about that. Um, I guess it's my hope that the next generation of scientists, whether you be scientists in academia or scientists in industry, whether you use your science uh, for the good of human beings in the classroom or in the office. I guess I wish that all of us 
contributes to building a community where we can have a family and the family that we want, where women feel safe in science, where people of color feel embraced in science. In a little bit, I think the older view of science was a an enterprise developed by a rich white men who had a lot of luxury. And so a little bit of the life is hard and it will suck to be a scientist and we will beat the love out of life out of you, which I don't actually think John means at all. I think he really loves science. Uh, I, but a, a little bit uh, in the people I was sitting in the back, that's a little bit how some of that uh, you won't get to see your kids or you'll only get to be one thing was maybe heard. Um, and I don't, I don't actually think it was meant that way, but I do think science really has to change. You know, some of you saw the email uh, from an NIH fellow, very disappointed uh, about her career, uh, who feels NIH has to do a whole lot better to take care of all of you. You are our most important human capital. Uh, more than the reagents and more than the tools. Uh, we have these people that come here and want to change uh, science for the better. And so while I think we haven't addressed all of the crises in science, and I agree with John that we've known for a long time that there were issues in science and there are disappointed people uh, entering this field uh, and leaving this field with the love of science beaten out of them, I actually think we could take a little bit of a different view, and that is that we work as a community uh, to take all the really good parts of science, the part where you just love a problem and want to solve it however you want to solve it, and that we learn how to do that in a more healthy uh, and more humane and more collaborative way. And some of that is taking every bit of John's advice because it was good, and superimposing on that, that we all have to learn to be human beings, and we all have to learn management skills, and we all have to learn interpersonal skills. And we have to all learn uh, to treat each other as the most valuable commodity that we have, as opposed to our list of publications or uh, the technique that we have. And so I've been here a decade. I actually shut my lab. I never, ever thought I would be so consumed by how is it that we can make the NIH a climate where people want to come and learn and where they leave every day as happy as when they came in? Um, but I actually shut my lab because I wanted to think about the career development of students. And it strikes me that uh, to make change from the bottom up means that every one of you who's sitting here takes the workplace dynamic series, all four parts. Even though it's labeled one, two, three, four, five, it's actually only four parts now. Each and every one of you takes it because it's how you learn about yourself and how you learn to interact with others. Each of you takes the mentoring course. Each of you takes the management boot camp. Each of you takes the diversity course and sits and talks about why is it uh, that as you ride the red line, life uh, expectancy in Montgomery County is far higher than it is in Washington, D.C. Every day, we ride the red line of health inequality. Those of you who commute with me on the red line, many of you do. I see a lot of you here. And so I guess while we're talking about how to reach the top, maybe we can think about how to carry many, many more people along with us, and maybe we can um, take the passion for science that I really enjoyed in John's talk, but maybe superimpose it on a little bit of a, I don't know, warmer? I don't know, more supportive? I don't know, more integrated life and work view? And I hope that you will join the Office of Intramural Training and Education uh, in doing that. So our next big event around careers is May 18th, the NIH Career Symposium. It will have about 1,000 people coming from all over the United States, but it's really for all of you who are here at NIH. Our workshops, uh, you know, it's interesting how uh, some workshops on relationship management are almost empty. But then when I talk to new tenure track PIs, they say the hardest thing is figuring out how to make this team a happy, fun place to do science. And so I will um, invite you all to expand the list of things that you need to do um, to really focus on your interpersonal skills. 
And I'm going to end with one last thing. I love that John flipped uh, the way he used alternative career, but I actually want to ask him to remove it forever from the slides. There is no such thing as an alternative career. There is no such thing as any kind of career, but a career that makes you very, very happy, that allows you to love the people that you love in the way that you want to love them, and that allows you to contribute. No careers are alternative. No lives are alternative. Alternative energy is cool. So if we are talking about alternative careers like that, that we all want to drive really super cool electric cars, then go have an alternative career. But because we know that the word alternative career comes in a negative, pejorative way of we weren't good enough, you're all good enough. You just have to find out exactly what you want to be good enough in. Um, many of us change our careers and we take a walk to the dark side and become administrators and it shocks me that I actually did that. But I really love the job that I do because of the fellows. And so I would hope that we can take the passion in John's talk and soften it a little bit to build a scientific enterprise that welcomes everybody. So thank you for being here and Wynn, thank you for the chance. Michael Gottesman um, has been an amazing mentor to me for 10 years. So um, I am pleased actually to introduce Michael. All right, well, two very difficult acts to follow. Um, so I was sitting and listening to John and thinking, I really agree with everything he says and thinking and listening to Sharon and thinking, yeah, Sharon is absolutely right. And uh, the common feature in both of their presentations is, is the passion. Um, in John's case, it comes through very clearly a passion for the science that we all share. Uh, in Sharon's case, who I know is passionate about her science, also uh, an equal passion for the people who do the science. And you can't have one without the other. So they're perfectly compatible presentations. Uh, and by the way, that's my job at NIH, to make sure that everybody gets along with everybody else. <laughs> So um, I thought I'd give you, um, as Wynn did at the beginning, a little bit of history. Um, so he mentioned all the responsibilities that I have, and I was shocked to hear them all. I, <laughs> what am I doing here? I have so much work to do. Um, but um, I think one important point to make is that uh, initially, the NIH was a place in which the government conducted scientific research. And before World War II, in fact, it was the only place in, in a sense, where biological research was done by the government. It's only after the war that the grant system developed and started moving money into the universities to support research. Um, and so our mission for many years was to conduct high quality biological research. Um, it wasn't until about 30 years ago in the late 1980s, which maybe seemed like a long time for you, but not so much for me, that NIH uh, actually was given the authority by the federal government to support um, intramural training. So this was called the ERTA Authority, Intramural Research Training Authority. And NCI had a separate but equal authority called CERTA Cancer Research Training Authority. Before then, and when I first came to NIH, there were no training positions at the NIH. Everybody who worked here was in a service position of some kind. They were equivalent of a staff scientist or a research fellow. Uh, they occupied an FTE. They were employed by the NIH to do to help support a job. Um, and when we wanted to have a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, we had to hire somebody to do that job uh, as a service position. And so the training authority uh, acknowledged the real importance of uh, NIH in the training community. And now I would say it is a co-equal responsibility. We have responsibility to do cutting edge research, but also to train you, the next generation of researchers. Um, and just to echo what Sharon said, you are our most important investment. There's no question about that. And so beginning around the time when we developed Earth Authority, NIH had what was called the Office of Education. It included both medical education and ed uh, education of postdoctoral fellows. Um, and then uh, we divided that up, and the medical education part moved into the clinical center. Um, and the office, which became the Office of Intramural Training and Education, that Sharon now runs, um, was responsible for the training of our students, postbacs, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, 
um, and took the job very seriously. And, and I have to say, Sharon is probably the world leader in thinking about uh, ways in which you can institutionalize uh, all the support that you need in order to make these difficult decisions that John was talking about. So let me just sort of uh, run through some of the things that you may take for granted and may not even be thinking about. So uh, I meet every two weeks with the scientific directors, um, and on an annual basis, we review salaries, the stipends that you get as postdoctoral fellows. And the goal is to keep pace with um, the local standards for payments, but also university standards. Uh, NIH, uh, over the last many years, has met uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act, which are pretty high stipends for postdoctoral fellows. And so um, we believe that our stipends are competitive. There may be, in academic circles, uh, some opportunity for people's uh, stipends to be supplemented with grant money and so on, which we do not have. Um, but at least our starting stipends for graduate students, for postdocs, postbacs, and postdocs are competitive. And that's something we actually think about and work about uh, every year, and we raise them a couple of percent this year in keeping with the increase in federal salaries as well. Um, health insurance, which is really a gold standard for our fellows, uh, is supported for the through the Foundation for Advanced Education in the Sciences, which is an organization not part of NIH, but supports NIH training specifically. Um, and they try very hard to provide insurance that is as good or better than the federal insurance which is available and assures that everyone who's here has uh, the support they need to take care of their health issues. Um, for some people, that can be considerable. If, if you have a child who needs care in a neonatal intensive care unit, that can run to hundreds of thousands and sometimes millions of dollars. And all of that is covered um, through our insurance. It's not perfect. But um, it's just something we think, think about all the time and make sure that, that everybody who's here is, has appropriate health insurance. Um, we have a bunch of other institutional programs, some of which you may not know about, and I wanted to mention them because this is an opportunity to talk about them. We have a program called the Keep the Thread program, uh, which acknowledges that postdocs, like people early in their careers, have occasionally reasons why they can't work full time in the laboratory, and we don't want you to lose your opportunity to continue in science if you choose to do that. Um, and so you can work part-time. And may, you may not be aware of this. There's a whole uh, program in place that allows you to work um, at least 50% of the time or sometimes less. To get health insurance, you have to work 50% of the time. Um, but we can arrange through various means to keep that less. And the idea by keep the thread, we mean continue maybe to come to the lab, continue to interact with people in the lab, uh, while you may not be able to work full time. And uh, that time that you take off is added to your postdoctoral, your five year maximum postdoctoral experience at the NIH. Uh, so it's a little bit like our stop the clock program for, um, for people who are on the tenure track. And it, and it acknowledges the flexibility that some people need in their lives in order to pursue careers in science. Um, this is not in any way to imply that uh, the institution itself can solve all of your problems, but it accepts that you each need the flexibility uh, to be able to continue in your careers. Uh, you heard about this already from John. Uh, we require individual development plans. You're supposed to meet at least annually with your PIs uh, and other mentors that you may acquire along the way to talk about your career goals and how you can best achieve them. Um, I have to admit that most of our PIs are pretty much focused on the laboratory part um, of their lives. And if you begin to think about careers in science policy or science writing or um, patent office tech transfer or alternative uh, uh, options to being in the laboratory, that, um, that you may not get the best advice. And so the, the um, NIH uh, Office of Intramural Training and Education has five career counselors. Um, this is Sharon's brainchild. We have professionals who will and should meet with you on a regular basis to help you think about what uh, career options you have and how best to achieve those. And then we all work together through the scientific directors and so on to develop uh, plans so that you can reach those goals. Could be a detail in an office at NIH um, it could be uh, a, a, a other, you know, experience that you might have on the weekends and so on that'll help you get where you want to be. 
Uh, you know about the FAIR Awards. That's not just an opportunity to be recognized for the quality of your science, but to actually serve on a study section that reviews the, the proposals, that is, the specific posters, um, and gives you an experience that other scientists have um, when they get to be PIs of actually evaluating other people's work and making decisions about whether um, to uh, award them or not. You heard about grant writing workshops. Most of you should have access to such opportunities. Um, opportunities to learn about mentoring, to be mentored, to have advocates, um, to, be, to be involved in wellness and cultural adaptation training from OIDI um, and all the other activities that Sharon mentioned. Now, another part of what we do, which may not seem like a positive to some of you, is we try to limit the postdoctoral experience. It is officially supposed to be five years at the NIH. And the reason for that is we want people relatively early on, maybe after the second or third year, to start thinking about what they want to do. Um, in fact, 10 years ago, the average postdoc here was three to three and a half years, and now it's more four and a half to five years. And that's extending further this period of sort of indecision. So we'd like you to start thinking earlier. Um, and one of the consequences, of course, if people are not beginning to plan their careers ahead of time is that the fifth year comes, and then they, people who love the NIH, everybody loves the NIH, want to stay here in some capacity. Uh, they can apply for positions here. I'll give you some statistics in a moment. These are not easy jobs to get. Uh, but you don't want to be in a situation where you're, um, you're, you're basically in a stopgap measure, just sitting in a position uh, waiting for something to happen. You need to take active control of your life. You need to take advantage of the opportunities that um, the, the various career counselors offer um, and really start thinking after maybe three years what you want to do. You can apply for K awards. But um, there are a lot of options, and um, I think, um, let me say something about employment of NIH fellows, because uh, John gave you statistics for the whole biomedical research enterprise. But um, the data we have is actually a, a little rosier for NIH uh, fellows. So um, he pointed out that uh, about uh, 40 years ago, uh, in the period when I was looking for jobs, 55% of postdocs got academic faculty jobs. So if you were a postdoc, you pretty much could get a job as an independent PI. Currently, that number is on the order of one in 10, one in eight, something like that. We don't know exactly what it is at the moment. Um, so that's very different. And so the likelihood of any one person getting an academic job is pretty low, but it appears to be better for NIH postdocs. And the data are not hard, and I, I, you know, I might stand corrected. The reason we don't know for sure what percentage of you will end up in academic positions is the government doesn't allow us to collect that data. Uh, it's considered a, a system of records, and the Privacy Act doesn't let us keep information for you once you've left about you once you've left the NIH. So what I have are two studies, one done by NIEHS, which was just reported, in which they looked at the fellows who went through the program there, and they actually tracked them using uh, internet searches to find out five and 10 years later what people were doing. And they have pretty good evidence um, that about a third of them are in academic faculty positions, uh, a third are in some kind of government position, and a third are in industry, and the rest doing a whole variety of different kind of interesting things. Um, we have a similar study that was done by NHLBI after the fact um, with about the same kind of numbers. Now. The other institutes, I can't say for sure, but we are trying very hard to collect the data. I think it's really important that we have those data. And the way we're doing it is the, um, the FAES, which is the foundation that ca carries your health insurance, um, is trying to collect data at the time when you sign off. Uh, so when you leave here, you have to sort of sign off the fact that you're not getting health insurance anymore. Um, and if you go over to the FAS office, which is in Building 10, uh, they will give you a $5 gift certificate for Starbucks if you fill out a questionnaire. And the questionnaire includes things like where are you going, why are you going there, and so on and so forth, so we can figure out where people are going. Um, we discovered in doing this that most people sign off online, and so there's an equivalent uh, gift certificate for Amazon um, if you fill out the questionnaire. It turns out that even though it's not a lot, 
it's sufficient to have people <laughs> get this that they are willing to fill out a relatively short survey. So I encourage you, if any of you are close to leaving the NIH, let us know where you're going, because we really need to know uh, what's happening to people who've been here. Um, in terms of the actual jobs at the NIH, because there's hardly anybody who wouldn't like to stay as a PI physician at the NIH, um, when John and I can, can tell you how wonderful it is to be a scientist here, it's really quite a privilege. Um, we have three kinds of searches. Two of them are general searches at the NIH for tenure track people. One named after the Statmans, Earl and Terry Statman, who are famous biochemists at the NIH. That's a general search uh, for all kinds of potential tenure track positions here. Um, there are 20 different uh, search committees that make up that search. Uh, and the idea is to find people and then match them with institutes that are looking for people with those kinds of skills. Um, we hire about 10 people, 10 to 12 people a year into those positions. Um, and in addition, we have a, a search for clinical investigators na named after Mary Lasker, uh, called the Laskers. And um, we uh, hire two to three people per year into those positions. And then there are additional positions that are lab-based and institute-based. And uh, in total, there are maybe 20 to 30 positions a year available at the NIH. We have 3,000 postdoctoral fellows. So the practical reality is there aren't enough positions to satisfy all of the talented people who are here. However, uh, some of you may believe that it's harder to get a job here if you're already a postdoc here. That is not true. 50% uh, of the Statman positions go to people who are already at the NIH and two-thirds of the Laskers, the clinical positions. So reality is that you have a real advantage in getting a job here, but still the statistics are not, not that much in your favor. So um, to end up, um, I've, I've painted both a positive and a sort of bleak picture about uh, the future. And um, what I wanted to say is that we are really interested in everyone being successful who's been here. Um, and I have a few suggestions. Uh, sort of along the lines that John had about things that you can do. Um, the most important thing is to start planning early. Don't wait until your appointment is ended before you start thinking about what you really would like to do next. So I would say after the second or third year of your postdoc, you should start thinking about what comes next. Um, if you can apply for K awards, um, as John said, that's probably the simplest pathway to a PI position outside or inside the NIH. Uh, getting those awards is really very helpful. It demonstrates that you have the discipline to write a good proposal um, and that your institution is willing to support the work that you want to do. Uh, another point is that uh, you really have to be prepared not to believe that you need to work in the Washington area. There are jobs all over the country, terrific jobs for scientists. Um, there are great universities in places other than the NIH or in Boston or San Francisco. Um, and you should, and New York and a couple other places, you should uh, be sure to think of those other places. Um, I know in some cases that creates family issues, uh, but, uh, you know, life is not fair. And I think hard decisions sometimes have to be made. Um, and then finally, be creative in the way you think about your scientific careers. Some may want to work in the lab and some in the clinics. But there are jobs in science policy, in science writing, uh, in tech transfer, um, a lot of jobs at NIH and grant review. The FDA is hiring a huge number of people now. Literally 1,000 people are being hired by the FDA over the next few years. And they love NIH uh, postdocs. And I personally know that many people are getting jobs there. Uh, you might be interested in starting a company. So being entrepreneurial is not a bad approach. People talk about consulting, and many people get jobs with some of these big consulting agencies like Deloitte or so on, um, where they get paid pretty well to give advice about scientific issues because um, lots of people around the country and out of the country want scientists to weigh in on how they should proceed in their businesses and so on. Um, and uh, one of the growth industries at NIH is in the area of regulation. Um, that's an area that I have to deal with all the time. We need people who have um, interest in regulatory affairs related to human subjects and other aspects of uh, animal care and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are going to be jobs as protocol navigators, as 
uh, people who are uh, compliance officers and so on and so forth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of other opportunities, including opportunities that you create for yourself. So on that note, I will end. And I think the plan is to have a panel and hopefully engage you in a real discussion about what comes next. Let me ask uh, Michael here. Uh, it seems to me that when there have been programs and uh, symposia, discussions, and so forth about alternative careers. We don't use that term anymore. Oh, excuse me. Uh, careers oh, they're in like alternative facts, is that it? OK. Other careers uh, than to be a PI. I, it seems to me that one thing that rarely is mentioned is this fact that uh, of linkage with a clinical department. Now, a long time ago, uh, clinical departments expanded like crazy by hiring many, many PhD scientists on things called research tracks and so forth. But they were all soft money. And if the investigator lost his or her grant, the individual was out. That was it. But then things dramatically changed when physician scientists began to decline and institutions had built buildings, had laboratories for big clinical departments, and many institutions changed the rules. So at one point, there were at least a dozen full professors of medicine in this country who did not have an MD. Most of them were in cancer centers or others, and a lot of that persists. Now, with the explosion in uh, informatics and the new science coming along, it seems to me that same kind of a scenario uh, is not totally out of the question, that uh, there will be opportunities for uh, primary appointments uh, in clinical departments, with secondary and basic science departments. Uh, we have a follow-up on the program I ran at Tufts, which was quite a few years ago now, but uh, the vast majority of people who went through the program we had there, PhDs wound up, many of them wound up in clinical departments, and who they've really thrived because the clinical young scientists were delighted to work with people who were trained at a more reductionist level. And in turn, they learned more about what really are the important questions that are being asked in terms of, of diseases. So I didn't mean to give a speech, but uh, <laughs> what are your comments? No one seems to yeah. discuss this. So uh, there are a couple of things that I didn't mention in terms of career directions, which are, I think, important. Um, when I think it's your statistic that about 50% of the PhDs, at least as of a few years ago, were actually ending up in faculty positions in clinical departments. And I suspect that is still true because the, the investment of money is, is going into, into clinical departments. But another, there was a report actually released just three weeks ago by the National Academy of Sciences about the future uh, of careers in science for postdoctoral fellows. Uh, and I have the name of the report. You can go to the National Academy website and download it for free. It's called The Next Generation of Biomedical and Behavioral Science Researchers Breaking Through. Uh, the main recommendation is that the government put more money into biomedical research. But one of the things they recommend is that there be more positions equivalent to what we at NIH call the staff scientist position. So these are... Uh, senior scientific positions at the NIH, in which people are not PIs in the sense that they're not um, independently creating the science, but they're working in teams to support science that's going on at the NIH. Um, and many people find those to be really attractive positions. The report suggests that NIH sh should be supporting more of those kinds of positions. Um, I know the NCI actually has a trial a project with grants going to uh, universities to support um, institutionally support those kind of positions. Um, in some ways, they're the best of both worlds, the opportunity to be a scientist working with other people, uh, having all the excitement of being in a group, 
uh, but not having to worry on a regular basis about applying for grants, uh, even outside of the NIH. So, um, John, you may have thoughts about this you issue have as well. Comment? Yeah, I mean, staff science does a great job. Um, just as Mike said, it can be the best of both worlds, and you don't have the pressure, uh, and also probably the, the time um, uh, liabilities that you would as a, as a PI. Um, you know, I think in the end, we really need to balance the number of people we're producing and the number of physicians, and it's not an easy problem. That, that That's the problem. Um, it's not a central uh, economy here. Universities have the right to do what they want, and, and even with the best of planning, it's worse than hurting cats. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not an easy problem, and you, but you guys, you, you, unless you want to go into policy, you can't worry about any of this. Uh, you just have to try to find the, the beauty of it and the, also the liability. It, it's completely quantal. Uh, you need one job, <laughs> not two or 10 or 100, just one. Uh, but until you get that job, then you're Zed, right? No, no job. So uh, I think the best advice I, I've heard today is at the end of your second or third year is start thinking about what the landing pad is going to be, what the goal is, um, and and try to get there. And uh, staff scientist position, I mean, certainly that's a possibility. Certainly consider it. It can be really good. It depends on the PI you work with. Right? You have to have that. That relationship is critical to that job. Uh, but if you get along well with the person, uh, that could be just fantastic. Yeah. Someone yeah. must have some questions and or comments yeah. or criticisms. I mean, go, go ahead. We we can all take it. Yeah. So if you have a question, if you would like to speak, I can give you yeah. the microphone or just come to this microphone. It's probably as easy. Okay. I hope you guys can hear me. So I just came back from a conference on Thursday. I can't believe the weeks passed by so quickly. Um, and one of my old mentors mentioned, mentioned to me very straightforwardly that the research that she's interested in and my research interests don't match. So I, I also work here, but I'm a student part-time in public health. So, which was kind of hard to hear because I still thought of her as my mentor, but you know, the way she laid it out is her work is in epilepsy, my work is in migraine, and they don't necessarily overlap 100%. Um, and she mentioned to me that I, I really need to find a good mentor that has like my interest 100%, like is willing to go to bat, in terms of certain situations to make sure I succeed. Um, and so as I'm, you know, looking at doctoral positions, I'm not a postdoc yet. I'm, I guess, a pre-doctoral student still in my graduate degree. How, what are some tips from, I guess, you guys for students that are looking for good mentors um, but can't necessarily find somebody who's, you know, that ideal person that's going to open opportunities for them or at least, you know, be willing to meet with them to explain what the strengths and weaknesses are. Because I, I mean, it sounds great, but it's really hard to find those people in my experience. So just any tips from you guys to like ERDAs or students that are in graduate school now would be great. That's a, that's a hard one. I'd say probably cast a wide net and uh, just get put it out there that you're looking um, for a, a mentor and uh, just approach people who, who you think might be okay and don't don't be put off by when, when people don't get back to you, right? And, and just, just cast it, you get an email you're not interested in, the, the worst that happens is you don't respond to it. You never take offense from the person who sent it, and usually you feel guilty that you haven't gotten back to them, just the opposite. So if someone, do, if someone like you were to write to me, I'd say, sure, I'll, I'll give them advice. So don't be afraid. You know, approach people you think might be able to give you good advice, and also your friends and colleagues, check with them, who, who people they might think. And, Particularly where you are, you don't. I don't think you. There's no. As a postdoc, maybe you need someone in your field to be your champion. But as a student, it shouldn't matter. That that kind of advice, you. I don't think you really need. I mean, if you're talking about w what lab you would want to do a postdoc in, that, that's a whole other thing altogether, right? And th that's not your question, though, right? I think that when you're applying to doctoral positions, um, when you're applying to a doctoral position, a good match between um, a good. Yeah. Okay, so um, a good match between the doctoral student and the mentor, I feel like, is brought up a lot. Um, when you're applying for PhD yeah, programs? Yeah, so a good match between a lab and um, uh, okay, mentorship. That's, not, that's probably not a field that the three of us are used to, because the things that we do, 
you generally apl apply to a department, and then you find your mentor down the road. In fact, most places, you have to do several different rotate. You, you get to sample the faculty and the labs you're interested in, you get to work for a couple of months in and, and feel the fit. I mean, that, that's more standard in a, a more of a, a bench-based um, yeah. lab. In, so mine's in, more like clinical and translational, and so the opposite then. of bench, and, and maybe, yeah. Uh, maybe Wynn can speak to that, I'm not sure. It's, it's more clinical, I, I don't know. It, it may be much more field specific, but I guarantee you whatever it is that you're interested in, there's, uh, this is the one place on earth you probably could find a person here yeah. who can help you because we have so many people in so many different fields. So just go on the internet and look around and email people, right? And just mm -hmm. see who's willing to talk to you. And I bet you get a nine out of 10, and, and well, a 10 out of 10 if, if they're intramural and you just say, I'm a student, I'm interested. Can I just sit down and come to your office and, and talk with you? So I think you might wanna start by finding somebody who actually has a broad view of who works here. So, for example, are you in the Neurology Institute or NIMH? Uh, it's kind of complicated, so I work as NIAD, but that's separate from my research interests. All right. Well, so, but you're interested in epilepsy, so I would go to Avi Nath, who's the yeah. clinical director of NINDS, and I would say, can you help me? Is there anyone here who could advise me about the work that I want to do? Are you interested in changing uh, your supervisor for your thesis? Is that... Um, no, so I'm pretty close to finishing my thesis. I'm going to be applying to doctoral positions towards the end of the year. Um, in the schools I'm looking at, I really want to make sure I have a good match of, you know, mentorship that I'm, I'm going to be there for a long while, you know, four to five years. So I, the programs I'm looking at, I want to make sure there's a good match between mentors or faculty there and my research interest. Um, and kind of not just be floating around for a little while, because I also know that's, right. that's not very productive right. for students. So, I mean, obviously you can look at the literature and see where, who is in your field, where, where are they located. Uh, you can talk to senior people here who know something about that field and get some feedback about whether that's a good place to be or not. So I think just uh, talking to people is the most useful way to get information. And don't be shy. There's nobody, I, I've never met anyone here who will totally say they won't talk to you. It's very unusual. Um, I take all comers. If somebody writes to me and says they want to talk to me, um, I'll be happy to talk to them. Sometimes it takes a little while. Yeah. I'm busy, but there's no more important thing for people who work here. Yeah. Thank you. That was really helpful. Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow here, and one of the pieces of advice that I got when I was in graduate school um, was basically that if I don't want to be a PI, that I shouldn't go do a postdoc because it delays your clock. If you can find a job before postdoc and you don't want to go be a PI, then you should just do it. And I think a lot of people instead end up in postdocs. Um, I one of them. Um, and I found the postdoc position valuable because it is additional training. But I think many years ago, you didn't need this additional training. And so I've seen a shift of, uh, and uh, I, Dr. Gotsman sort of said this, that we are early career scientists, but I'm also almost 30 and I'm still being trained. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on sort of the shift to uh, when is it that we become sort of independent and uh, what is the right timeline to sort of make the jump from a training position to uh, an actual you know, staff position or something like that? So I, I think it is true that some people who have PhDs don't need to do postdocs but they usually know precisely what they want to do and know that the postdoc is not a requisite part of that job. I mentioned the FDA, for example, and I know for a fact that the FDA, who are trying to hire people who can oversee drug development and so on, will not even look at anyone who hasn't done a postdoc because they have a, a large pool of talented, highly trained people that they can choose from. So if you were interested in such a job and you hadn't done a postdoc, you're, you're, you just simply wouldn't get it. Um, any, any education that you get um, that expands your universe, that gives you information and tells you how to get things done is valuable. Now, you said 
you mentioned your age and so on and so forth, which those of us sitting at this uh, panel think is awfully young to be worrying about that. Um, yes, so I remember actually my wife and I, my wife is a scientist at NIH, uh, said we wanted to have jobs by the time we were 30, jobs, real jobs, <laughs> not just a postdoc or whatever. Um, and that age has changed over the years and it's gotten a little older. Uh, the statistics are pretty amazing. NIH, time of first NIH grant is now 44 years old, um, which is amazing. It used to be 10 years younger, and it should be 10 years younger. So that's a real problem. Uh, but each person has their own clock. I think John wants to say something about this issue. <laughs> it's really lamentable, because I think those are 10 of your best years as a scientist, that you're not a PI. and. That, that's one of the worst trends. And with an MD-PhD, it's even worse. It's 45 or 46. And many careers, you're winding down at that point. You know? If you've got the Wall Street, you're counting your money at that point, right? So th this is something we really need to fix. Um, the advice you got was good advice. For most things, if you don't need to do a postdoc, it's probably not a great idea to do it. But if you've had a good experience, fine. And that does open other doors, as, as, as Mike said. So. Here's the thing, there's no one, you know, it's getting advice, no, no one size fits all. And there's, no, there's nothing we can tell you that's going to be true for everybody all the time. Every individual needs uh, different advice, and that's the good thing about having different mentors and never believing anything completely from any one person. I mean, you're trained to be skeptic, so that's probably not hard, right? Uh, yeah, it is, uh, plotting a course is, is hard, and there's a random element to it. Um, that I think is the most troubling part. It used to be, if you were keen and you were good at it, you were going. To, there was a guarantee you would you would have a chance of, of being a PI. And now we've added a, a major element of of luck that I think is just not fair to you guys. And and that I think is the main thing we need to address. Yeah. We have a question. Here. Sure. Okay. This probably should really be directed towards Sharon, but since she's not here, then I'm going to direct it towards you, Michael. Um, so I am actually um, a PhD who did not decide to pursue research after I graduated. Um, and I'm actually now a staff assistant um, for one of the centers in NHLBI. And um, with that, so I'm a part of the um, NHLBI basic leadership discovery. And I was wondering, is there some sort of similar course that's offered to like um, scientists at NIH or specifically NHLBI? something equivalent, since you guys mentioned that both like um, the, being a PI or being a researcher might not be the primary focus of everyone here. Um, and I feel like a lot of the career opportunities or workshops are really focused towards grant writing or really staying in science. And I was just wondering what else was offered to try and foster um, individuals to be like the best set and best prepared when they go job searching? Um, so I think that, that Sharon would be the best person to answer that question. But um, in theory, I'm her supervisor. So I should know the answer to the question. So as I said, the, there are five career counselors. And they will certainly meet with you um, and help you develop ideas for how you can succeed either at the NIH. You already have a job at the NIH, sounds like. So the question is, how, how can you develop your career outside of the normal route, which is graduate school, post postdoc, and then something else. Um, and I, I think Sharon has talented professional people who can help you work through that. Um, within your institute, I think you need to find mentors and advisors who can see a track for you uh, to advance through the various steps of, uh, of career uh, ladders within NHLBI or other institutes. There are a huge number of jobs for people like you who have your doctoral degree and are interested in uh, providing support for some function or other that exists within the institutes. And all the institutes have such positions. Uh, I mentioned, for example, protocol navigators. So protocol navigators are people who actually write, with the help of a PI, a protocol for clinical study. So it's, it's enormously rewarding to be involved in the, in the beginning at designing a study and knowing exactly how to um, write that study so it gets through the various regulatory processes and so on. 
we're hoping that people like you with science backgrounds, hopefully some writing skills, can get interested in, in protocol navigation, as an example. There are other opportunities. But there, there are probably a dozen different job uh, descriptions that you would enjoy learning about. And you're asking a good question. I think our career counselors are most likely to be able to answer that. Actually, the NCI runs a course which is um, organized and run for staff scientists and staff clinicians, but we accept postdoctoral fellows to attend. So that's one example of the institute that already started the formal course of preparation for alternative careers in um, science. And they want to check that out. Well, are there any any other questions or comments? Here's your opportunity. Okay, if not, I would just like to make a brief announcement to call your attention that next week is the final session of the 2018 Demystifying, and we're really very delighted that Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, is going to speak to everybody uh, about the national, his title is the National Institutes of Hope. And I'm sure it will be very rewarding and revealing and exciting for all of us. And we hope that you will tune in. So thank you very much, Michael and Jonathan. And Karen,